I don't think it's the end. I want to do it only if I enjoy doing it, even if nobody listened to it. I'm having more fun building a media company than I have at any startup I've ever started. My highest high at Twitch. I'm famous, mom. <laughs> I should have done better. I feel guilty and that's okay. That's part of the human experience. I would choose to not start a service company. Hey guys, welcome to Silicon Valley Girl. We're about to hop on a Zoom call with Justin Khan. Uh, Justin Khan is a co-founder of Twitch. They sold this platform to Amazon for almost $1 billion. He started several more companies. He started a company called Atrium, which was a legal startup. They later shut it down. Uh, he interviewed Lingua Triple Y Combinator. We didn't get in, but we got into his Series A program at Atrium. And overall, he has this great Silicon Valley journey from building a company and selling it to starting a company and then shutting it down and now being a VC and being active on social media. So we're going to chat about a bunch of things. Let's do it. All right. Justin is in the waiting room. Shall we let him in? Okay. We met before, right? Yes. Like, we... uh, you came to one of, one of my atrium events, I think. Yeah. I was at, uh, with your series A program. We were at like a company, a couple, was it a couple of years ago? I think it was 2019. And then actually the first time we met was in 2015 when you interviewed us for Y Combinator. That was like our first week in Silicon Valley. We were invited by 500 startups and then we also got an invite from YC. And uh, that was like a life-changing week. <laughs> but we didn't get in. Yeah, I wasn't too too mean in the interview. No, 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 no. You were, you were nice. <laughs> oh, I think, was it 26? So we interviewed twice. Maybe it was 2016. But anyways, yeah, uh, life changing. Uh, so it's been yeah six years in Silicon Valley. Super cool. Yeah, so I wanted to chat to you about a variety of topics. I know you, you moved from San Francisco, right? Yeah, I just I just moved out of San Francisco. And where you are right now? In Northern California, just like on the coast. Oh, nice. And you're gonna stay there? I don't know. I'm like in the middle of nowhere. I live in like a 2000 person town. Mm -hmm. and there's nothing out here and so it's just, i just um stay at home i'm on record zoom videos. you know record videos <laughs> now i'm recording yeah. videos exactly I'm, it's it's all right like people will come up here and visit but which is nice because i think everyone wants to get out of the city during the pandemic but once kind of things come back i don't know if i'm you know we'll see i might move to la LA, not not back to san francisco or like silicon valley i don't think i'm going to move back to san francisco because i i think the interesting thing is with the pandemic, it's really unlocked remote work. You know, I can invest from anywhere. I can meet people from anywhere. I feel like, you know, people connect online now. It's like, okay, you know, it's just, it's, that's fine. It's not quite as good as, as in person, but it's, you know, it's a pretty 90% substitute. And so there's just so many other places in the world I'd, I'd like to live, you know? Do you think it's the end of Silicon Valley then? Or what do you think? I don't think it's the end. I think there's always, you know, I hear young people about like, who are, you know, young founders who are like, I want to move to San Francisco. I talked to one, you know, I talked to them regularly, actually, like people who are just starting off and they want to move to San Francisco because they still want that serendipity and it is where the action's happening. That's one thing. And then the second thing is I think all of the FANG companies, you know, the, the Facebooks and Googles, like the executive layer of those companies is going to want to be close to headquarters. Mm -hmm. So they're going to, they're going to be in the Bay area and in San Francisco. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And okay. So, so what does your day to day look like? Because you mentioned you're investing. I see you everywhere in social media. I see you on YouTube, TikTok, clubhouse, uh, Twitter. Uh, so what is your day to day now? So I, I'm like, uh, you know, who my role model is Gary Tam. I want to be Gary Tam when I grow up and Gary's like, I was talking to Gary the other day and, um, Gary was telling me, he's like, yeah, I hired all these people I'd initialize so I could spend more time making content. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of how I feel. I'm like, my day job is investor. I have this early stage fund called Go Capital. That's a $50 million seed fund with my friend Robin. And we invest in early stage companies. And that's what I do for, you know, kind of most of the day. I'm talking to founders, trying to mentor founders and, and find new investments. But then I just love creating content. You know, it's like I was always into it at different waves in my life. And mm -hmm. now I'm kind of getting back into it. Yeah, you you started with it. You started with creating content on, on Twitch. Yeah, streaming. I was like that's live amazing. streaming like 12 years ago and then or 13 years ago. And then I um, there was I had this wave on Snapchat where I was like giving advice on mm -hmm on Snapchat stories, but Snapchat wasn't like viral, right? It wasn't a really good platform for creators. So when I started my last company, when I started Atrium, I, I gave that up. And then now I've just been getting back into it. And it started off with um, 
about eight months ago, my friend was like, hey, you should start a podcast. And he was really selling me on this idea of creating a podcast. So I said, okay, I'll just try it. And I really loved it. I loved the opportunity to connect with someone for just like an hour or two and really ask them questions about themselves. You know, like normally you don't have that opportunity in your life to just spend time yeah. talking to your friend and, and finding out about them. So I did that for a couple of months and I didn't promote it at all because I was like, I want to be completely intrinsically motivated. Like mm -hmm. I only, I want to do it only if I enjoy doing it, even if nobody listened to it. Nice. Mm -hmm. uh, so the views were like, you know, they were like a hundred views or it was like a thousand views a, an episode or something like mm -hmm. that, which is you know, not mm -hmm. that hard. But then I started, I was like, okay, well, if I'm putting all this work in, I should um, work with some people to, to try to make this a little bit more popular. And so I hired a uh, kid off this um, kind of like Gen Z server called Gen Z Mafia, uh, who uh, his name's Brent. And he was kind of like became my executive producer of my podcast. And then he was like, okay, well, we should start promoting it all these places and you should start doing this other content. And then that snowballed until I, I like, I basically started working with uh, someone on my, uh, on my YouTubes and my TikTok. She was like, you got to be on TikTok. So then I was like, okay, let me figure this platform out. And, and that's mm -hmm. where I'm at now. I'm like making all this content 24 seven and loving. And, and you have this two people team, right? So basically three people, including you, right? To create all. There's, and there's some part-time people. So it's, it's ballooned into this. We have one executive producer, uh, one uh, of my podcasts, one person who's basically the producer and editor for my YouTubes. Uh, and then I have someone who's working on my newsletter content. So we started a newsletter, which is like the content so. for yeah. the podcast. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that as well. Yeah. yeah. And then we have like a, an editor for the like audio and video content, like actually two people who kind of like freelance part-time edit. So you're like, you're like building a media company, right? I know. Yeah. Now I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've accidentally backed into it and you know what? I'm having more fun building a media company than I have at any startup I've ever started. Wow. It's so weird. It's because people would say, oh, it's not scalable. It's not like a product company. You know, it's not like a tech company. I don't care. Like it's so much fun maybe because it's just you because because you don't have investors right any co-founders it's just you having fun yeah just me having fun it's it's uh i get to work with people who i i love to see um you know i've done that in the past but it, it's i i picked really great people to work with and uh, we built this little community on discord where uh, we have like people who come in and it's almost like the podcast is becoming community driven where uh we'll let our community watch live and sometimes they ask questions and they help me with like figuring out what questions to ask. And so it's just like a really fun vibe, you know, like it's, uh, it feels a little bit like the early days of Justin TV, where I was like working with all my friends and we were just yeah. experimenting. And, you know, it's kind of like, we were, we were just seeing what would happen, you know, yeah. without this like end goal in mind of like, Oh, it's going to be this. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. And, uh, do, are you missing something like, because I'm in this create, I've been in this creator space for like also six years. And, uh, I realized that creators are new entrepreneurs. And, uh, because I have a school for YouTubers, I see them struggling. Like they struggle to hire people because they've never done that before. And I'm also looking for like opportunities in this space. Do you see like anything, what creators are missing, what you as creator, uh, are missing. Oh, like tools wise. Yeah. Like platforms and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's cool to see, you know, it's interesting. Cause I'm also in my, with my investor hat. I'm like, I want to invest in tools and software and businesses for the creator economy. And there's this explosion of them. You know, you've seen like Legion, uh, sort of fund, uh, to, to invest in these companies. Yeah. 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 You know, people are, there's companies like, um, that are doing the finance side. There's stir, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Stir is one. And there's one called carrot. That's like a bank or like a credit card. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's one side. And then the people are doing like, um, my friend Walker started this company called fourth wall, which is like a Shopify for creators mm -hmm. where people can kind of create a, a storefront, you know? And mm -hmm. so I'm seeing all of these different tools and, um, it's cool because like now I can evaluate it as like the customer and yeah. then also as the investor, you know, like, so it's mm -hmm. a little bit of a crossover to my, my day job. So what do you think will be the next big thing in creator economy? <sighs> um, this is one of those ones people are going to go back to and they're going to be like, you know, you were right, wrong. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> what do, I think, so I definitely think storefront and like having a master storefront for how to engage your 
your creator, your your fan base. Like what I like about what what Fourth Wall is doing is that they have it's not just the buying stuff, but it's also like you can leave people personalized notes, right? Like when somebody buys something, I can send them back a video oh, nice. that says, you know, like, hey, thanks for buying, you know, the hat or whatever. Hope you enjoy it. Or so it's almost like combined with cameo, something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. And then also has like donations built in. And so there's there's um I think something that's like a website is, is like for creators is is interesting because you know I've been building websites on the internet for a long time just and there's ne- there hasn't really been something specifically for that like there was for e-commerce you know yeah that's true and so um, just to wrap up this section like what what does your day look like these days how much time you spend on social how much time you spend chatting to founders if I tell <laughs> my LPs are gonna be like what the fuck when I answer this question but, <laughs> like so. Um, I, let's see, I'll look, look at my calendar right now. You know, I, I spent, uh, let me try to be honest about this instead of like what I think it, the answer is. So this last week, it looks like every day I probably spent three to four hours talking to founders mm-hmm. or companies, maybe three hours on average talking to co- companies. And I probably spent, I'll probably spend two hours making content every day. Mm-hmm. So it's like six hour work day, right? Yeah. Well, somehow it seems longer than that. It's probably like eight hours. And then there's probably two hours of like other stuff. Like that was like three hours of talking to new founders, two hours of content, and then probably three hours of um, just like talking to other people who aren't founders, like other investors and like, Mm -hmm. you know, lawyers, accountants, like all the administrative stuff around running a fund and, and, you know, helping me. There's some some of that is like helping portfolio companies as well. Got yeah. It. But a significant amount of the day, probably a quarter of the day, I'm like, I'm making content because I, I don't know. I just, I love doing it. Me too. Yeah. It's my favorite part of the day. Um, let's talk a little about Twitch because um, this is like a lot of people know you for Twitch. And uh, my first question was, uh, did you know that it's going to be big right from the start? Because when you started, you were just broadcasting yourself. Did you have this idea that, you know, we're going to let other people do the same thing or was it just, you know, you having fun? Yeah. When we started, it was, the idea was to create other streams. So we started off as Justin TV in 2006. Mm -hmm. And the idea was, you know, before there was YouTube live or Instagram or Twitter, we were like, we're going to create a reality show about the four founders. I mean, from my point of view, so I was kind of carrying the camera around and we're going to do a 24 seven live stream. And it wasn't, it was called Justin TV because it was like me, but it wasn't just supposed to be me. It was supposed to be, you know, we'll eventually we'll add different people from different walks of life and, you know, people will see their, their, their lives. And we did not think it was, we had an idea that it could be big. I think our core insight was people are interested in other people. You know, they want to see other people, learn about other people's stories. I think that's why YouTube's so powerful or TikTok or Instagram or any social media. So there was some kernel of uh, insight into that, but- Mm -hmm. The problem was 24 seven is not interesting, right? Like most people are just mm-hmm. doing boring stuff, mm-hmm. 23 hours and, you know, 50 minutes of the day. And there's 10 minutes maybe that are interesting. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, I don't need to tell you for like your YouTube video, you probably film an hour of content of filming to get down to like five minutes of wow. content, you know? Yeah. 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 And so you have to need, you need editing to make it interesting. And, and that's the part that we were kind of missing. Mm-hmm. Um, so we didn't think, we didn't know how big it would be, but eventually, you know, we rolled it out as a, a platform for anyone to broadcast live and it became very popular, a top 250 website in the world. And then from there, that's when we really identified gaming and turned it into Twitch. Mm-hmm. When we were working on Twitch, we did not, it was very contentious internally. You know, by that time we were like a 25 person company. It was a real company. We were making you know millions of dollars in revenue, but it wasn't growing anymore. And so we were like, okay, we need to do something else. Mm-hmm. And Twitch was this idea that my co-founder Emmett had. He was like, we, we should work on the gaming content because that's what I like. Mm-hmm. And the big debate internally was like, is this big enough? You know, is gaming mm-hmm. something where, uh, you know, it can support a big company and people inside, like lots of people who were working at the company did not think that at first, you know? And how do, how do you know that the idea is big enough? Like, I think a lot of companies have this problem. They're working on this problem. They love working on it, but they're asking themselves what's next. And how do I know, like, even if the market is evolving, like creator economy, you can't really say how big it's going to be. Like, what would you tell those founders? 
but kind of stuck. You know, like I think the most important thing is you work on something you care about. Mm -hmm. Number one most important thing is you got to work on something you care about. And the reason that's important is because if you don't work on something you care about, you're going to give up, you're going to burn out. And what's the market? What if the market is too small? I mean, you're like getting these responses from investors or whatever. You don't believe that the market can be big. Well, I mean, that we, we first of all, anything that I actually covered this in my latest, latest YouTube video, it's like things that seem small, if you put them on the internet, they become big. Like there's, mm -hmm. there, there's almost no industry on the internet that they can't make you a millionaire if you just work on it. I believe, I really believe that. Now it might not be venture scale, like mm -hmm. multi-billion dollar company, but like, People may become millionaires on, you know, making like widgets for like one thing, you know, fidget spinner. Oh yeah. That's crazy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, so there are, you know, I like, there's so many companies in Y Combinator that never achieved this like DoorDash or Airbnb outcome, but they actually are still like a multi-million dollar profitable business in a, in a little, you know, it's making an app that's like for like people to share photos in a specific niche or whatever, you know, like it's, there's, there's there's so many different possibilities out there. So I wouldn't be discouraged by like what other investors think. Can you like remembering your journey at Twitch, what was your highest high? Because you sold a company, but you had this amazing journey of like more companies evolving and you film broadcasting yourself. What was like the best moment that you want to relieve? Oh man, my highest high at Twitch. I think it was, you know, at the time I was so, well, I mean, there's, there's, there's a bunch, but like, you know, okay, starting off, in the beginning, you know, I wanted to do Justin TV. Part of it was because I was like somebody who always wanted approval and uh, from my, my peers and, and to be popular. And, you know, I was a, not a super popular kid when I was, when I was younger. And, and so for me, a big part of it was like, oh, if I become this famous internet guy, then like maybe people will like me. And mm -hmm. so there were these moments in the very early days after we launched where, you know, we had one moment where, um, I remember I was in a taxi and this guy recognized me. He was like, oh, are you Justin from Justin TV? And I was like, oh, that's amazing. It's the first time it happens, you're like, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. It's like, I'm, like, I'm famous, mom. Like, yeah. It was incredible. So that was one moment, you know, there was, we, we, when we became profitable, I remember we became a profitable company and we had like just been raising money and spending it. And like, we were very tight fisted. Like we were, we were frugal, but, but, you know, we raised a lot of money, like $7 million and, um, we didn't know if we would ever get to, you know, being a real profitable company. And we got there and we might, I remember looking at my co-founder, Michael, and I was like, wow, we did it. Like we are a real company. Like it's a company that like, it is now going to be alive by default unless we really mess something up. Yeah. And that was an amazing feeling. Um, and then there was this feeling when we, I remember when we, I heard the deal that we were gonna do like Emmett first gave me this like before we were gonna sell to Amazon uh we got an offer from Google yeah I watched that video gonna leave all the links below yeah <laughs> yeah so like at 850 it was at 850 million dollars and 150 million dollars in retention I remember Emmett calling me and I'm in the, an office and I fall on my knees and I'm just laughing at that amount of money I'm like that is insane you know like that's it's like it was incomprehensible at the time so and you haven't given up too much equity right so you no we gave up a lot we gave up a lot people think it's like they're like justin's a billionaire from this but no we we gave up a lot because we had done all these rounds of fundraising we didn't weren't very good fundraisers and we also had four co-founders you know so like and there are also taxes right it's like the this a lot of taxes a lot of a lot of taxes <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, so you know i mean but the point is it, like we still, we made a lot, you know, we don't, it's like, we never have to work again ever, you know, if we don't want to, but I mean, everybody's gone on to do things they love to, you know, it turns out working and kind of building interesting stuff is in a way it's own reward. So, you know, we've continued, we've continued doing stuff. And when you continue doing stuff, do you ever have this fear that, you know, Twitch was the biggest thing I've ever built in my life. What if I never come up with an idea that is as big as Twitch? I used to have that feeling. I used to have that fear all the time, actually. Mm -hmm. I used to think like, oh, that's like, I, I have to do it bigger. Cause like, you know, your story of my progression should go up and up and up. And mm -hmm. I think it's only recently in the last couple of years that I, I released that, you know? And I think that's what's letting me enjoy my media company so much is like, I don't have any expectations. Like mm -hmm. I would love for it to be able to pay for the people who work on it. So I'm not losing money. How were you able to let it go through? Cause you're, you were meditating, right? You were doing a lot of. Yeah, yeah it was like a, 
a lot of meditation. Like, so what happened was when we met, you know, where, I mean, the last time was I was working on Atrium and I'm building this big company with big expectations. Mm-hmm. We were $75 million, mm-hmm. right? Like with, you know, in the first 18 months. So that's not nothing. It's, a, you know, that's a lot. People gave me a lot of credit and I was like, okay, I'm going to build this thing. And then it stopped, you know, it, things weren't going that well. And I was so wrapped up in it. And I was like, really torturing myself. I'm like, what did I do wrong? I like did, you know, I, I should have done this. I should have done this. I should have started a different company. I should work with different people, whatever. I was like blaming the whole world except for myself. Right. Like, yeah. and, and I started, I was like, this is not sustainable. Like, why am I so stressed? Like if I am feeling this way right now, then, you know, like it doesn't make any sense because objectively, if this company fails, which it did, I can go back to doing a, being an investor, which is a very nice like job to have, right? And which I, is what happened. Um, and so it didn't make sense to me conceptually, but then I, I was looking for a solution and I started meditating. You know, I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna meditate and uh, just see what, you know, like as a, as a stress relief. And so I started meditating and um, I ended up, uh, you know, it worked. So I felt good about it. And then I just kept doing it and built a consistent habit. And eventually, you know, that's kind of the start of how I was able to like, let go of some of, of these, you know, the compulsive need to like be for the outside world to be a certain way. Cause that's, yeah, that's the main problem. I think with people here in Silicon Valley, like you're in this buzz where somebody races around, somebody starts clubhouse. <laughs> so it's this, this, and that, and you're like working in your company, but you realistically, you only have like two or three major breakthroughs in your life and it doesn't have to happen every day. But yeah, it's, it's great that you're like, comparison. Yeah. Comparison is the thief of joy. You know, like it's, oh, yeah. It's uh, I love that saying because it's so true. And I used to compare myself all the time. Like, you know, people think they probably compare themselves to me. They're like, oh man, that guy, you know, he's only 37 or maybe he's like, they're like, he's very old, but like, you know, he's so successful or whatever. If I just was able to create a company like Twitch, I'd be happy. But like I sold Twitch and then I was looking at my friends who started Dropbox or Airbnb or one of my friends is, you know, the founder of Coinbase and they're going to go public this year, whatever, some insane valuation. And I would, I'd be like, man, I should have done better. Mm. You know, I should have done better. I should have kept going. I should have done X, Y, or Z. And it's so easy to get caught up in that, you know? So for me, that was a, that was something I was always, you know, I was always torturing myself about that. And um, I think letting it go was kind of the most important thing I've ever learned in my life, really. Yeah. I think it's very important for every entrepreneur out there. And to, can I ask you a little about Atrium? Like, when you decided to shut it down, was it because you lost motivation? Because I also feel like I saw this tweet that you retweeted from someone who was telling like startup founders, you can't shut your company down because this is who you are. And then you're like, or you posted someone who said it's completely wrong. You can't just rely on your company all the time. So was it because you, th- you thought that your energy could be better off somewhere else or like what was the main reason? I, I did have an obligation to like really try my best to, to mm-hmm. bring it home. And so I, we spent like, there were some serious problems that kind of happened throughout like the, the 2019 year where, you know, we were, we had a, a lot of top line revenue actually, but the margins were not that good mm-hmm. and they were actually terrible. And there was, we, the things that we're trying to fix it were not working, right? And mm-hmm. so we were like, this is not, at a certain point I realized like, it is not a venture scale business. Like we have a business that's, you know, I'm basically paying subsidizing for this business to exist, but it wouldn't exist naturally. And the margins are like not very good in it. And there's a like pretty high attrition rate. Uh, So, you know, to me, we ran out of ideas on how to make it work. And then we thought about pivots, but like, I didn't, we couldn't really think of an idea where I felt like this is going to work. Like, this is a good use of capital. Like where I thought if this was my money, not my you know money I raised, I would spend it on trying to build this business. You know, mm-hmm. I didn't, I was not able to think of something. And, and so for me, it just didn't feel intellectually honest to say, mm-hmm. okay, well, we're going to do, you know, this is what we're going to, we're going to pivot to and spend our money on and time on. Yeah. But, well, you try to pivot, right? There was like January when you tried to pivot. Yeah, yeah, we tried, we tried. Oh, we was said it some... already like you realized it's actually shutting down or? Well, I was kind of like, I think in my heart, I knew it was like not the right direction for the company, but 
I was kind of going through the motions. And then at a certain point, I was like, okay, we got to stop. Like, this is not, it's not going to work. You know, what was the hardest about that decision? Investors or employees or yourself? The investors were incredibly supportive. So, I mean, I was shout out the investors. I mean, Andreessen Horowitz, general, general catalyst, mm-hmm. you know, Andrew Chen and, and Nico Bonazza, so from, from the two firms were very, very supportive. And, and Michael Seibel from Y Combinator as well. They were on our board and along with Mark Andreessen, they were so supportive of me. Like, I just felt like I really, you know, I cried actually. I was like so thankful. And like, they, you know, they were mm-hmm. there. I, people couldn't ask for better investors in my opinion. Now, I, mm-hmm. the hardest part was we laid off like more than a hundred people, you know, like that, mm-hmm. that, that was tough. And yeah. like, I had a deep love and respect for many of them for all of them really. But like many of them, you know, I consider friends. I, I do consider friends and, you know, f- trying to help people navigate how to get a job and stuff. And that was, you know, that was a worry for me. Um, mm-hmm. Now that being said, like everybody landed on their feet and, and they did go and, and get jobs and, and they're kind of, off to the races so it's that's great um you know which is which is good it's like uh everything as an entrepreneur you always think things are going to be everything that's happening at this moment that's a crisis you're like this is the end of the world oh yeah but always, you know every yeah day. you've been yeah. you've been there <laughs> yeah but it never is and what about you what about like yourself did you by that time did you learn how to separate yourself from the business or was it just like the end of the world no, by that time I'd already, I was already okay. I was, you know, myself, I, I knew, like I went through a couple of difficult experiences that helped me. They were almost like the final test, maybe not mm-hmm. final, you know, but the, they were a test of my meditation practice and my mindfulness practice where I was like, oh, you know, I'm going through this difficult experience, but it, it doesn't define me. It's like, I'm not getting swept along with it. You know, that actually a couple of months before we shut down, I got in this accident, I broke both my arms and like, Oh, I said the motorcycle, what is it? Motorcycle or bike? Yeah, it was a bicycle. It was, I was, I do ride motorcycle. Well, not anymore, uh, but I used to ride, but it wasn't a motorcycle accident. It was just on a bicycle. I flipped over the handlebars and I landed on both elbows and bam, I like broke, broke, broke both elbows and, um, and split my lip here, like right here. It was like kind of busted open. And, um, Mm -hmm. they, uh, they, you know, I had to have surgery and this like long PT process, but every day I asked myself, like, do I wish things were different? And the answer was always no, because, you know, I felt like I was really be able to be present with the experience thanks to my practice meditation, uh, meditating. And, um, and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't fighting against the experience. So when it came to shutting down the company, it was like another, you know, it's just kind of another speed bump. Mm -hmm. I was like, Oh, this is like a really tough experience. I feel bad. I feel guilty about laying off this number of team members. And I, you know, I, I had all these emotions about, it, but instead of fighting it and saying like, I don't want to feel that way. I was just able to sit with it and just be like, okay, I, I feel guilty. And that's okay. That's part of the human experience. That's so important. Yeah. I love, I love it. I didn't have to fight against it because my whole life as an entrepreneur, I always fought against difficult experiences. You mm-hmm. know, like if, if I had anxiety about like, oh, how are we going to make payroll next month? Or this company is going to crash and burn, you know, because the traffic's not growing. I would like really, really not want to feel that way. And then I would, I would drink a lot. Actually, one was one thing, or I would just watch Netflix for like six hours at a time, you know, like go home at like 8 PM and watch Netflix till like two and like, just be in bed, you know? And mm-hmm. so I was always trying to escape and for me, one of the most powerful things about meditation as to be, you know, as an entrepreneur was the ability to be with my experience and not th- need things to be different at that moment. Yeah. Yeah. That's super important. And t- do you think you will ever start a company again? Well, you know, with Go, we are in- incubating some companies, but we're not, I'm not going to be the CEO of a company ever again. Like I, I'm yeah. a better coach now than I am a, uh, than I am a, a CEO, you know, I've come to come to terms with that. And so, Mm-hmm. And can you, uh, I saw you tweet about never starting like a service company again. Can you elaborate a little? Well, so, so service companies are fundamentally companies where you don't have leverage, right? You don't have operational leverage. So a service company, is, you know, whether it's a law firm or like a commercial real estate firm or, you know, accountant or whatever, it's like relying on selling the labor of individuals. And there's mm-hmm. a couple of problems. Like one is like, the people who are selling that labor, they don't necessarily want to be more efficient, right? Because you're, you're not incentivized to. So that's one. So you're paid by hours, problem. right? Yeah. Exactly. When <laughs> you're so, selling hours, mm-hmm. that's your product. So, mm-hmm. and then the second thing is like, it's just 
messy to organize that many human beings in a specific direction. It's a lot of work and, it, and you don't have that much leverage. When you build a product, like if you build a piece of software and you sell it to a thousand people, it's just, it, you saw, and you sell it to the next 10, you know, 9,000 people, it's basically just as much work. Matter of scalability, right? Yeah. <laughs> you have to scale the servers a little bit, you know, that's it. But like, you get like so much more leverage. Whereas if you want to serve, a th if you're serving a thousand customers at a, at a, at an accounting firm and then you're scaling up to 10,000, well, that's like 10 times as much work, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's just, that's, that's the reason why, like people are always going to start services companies because, you know, that's part of the, one of the big, big roles in the economy, uh, you know, you know, across all sorts of different service sectors. But if you're an entrepreneur and you're choosing, if you have a choice, I would choose mm -hmm. to not start a service company. Yeah, completely agree. Cause we have, we had both parts and now we like working on the platform part, not like the service part. <laughs> Absolutely true. Yeah, I have a couple of like um, final questions. Um, how do you, like when you advise your startups, how do you tell them to stay focused on an idea? Again, going back to like problems in Silicon Valley where everyone is starting this new big thing. Uh, there, there was the time when everybody wanted a chat bot and now everyone is talking about Clubhouse. How do you stay focused on your own company without like, or is it good that you're trying different things all the time? Yeah, I think it's, you know, the conundrum is most people, many people who start on, there's like kind of two types of entrepreneurs, right? One type is like, they just like want to solve this one problem in the world. They're monomaniacal about that. And they just like, that's their life's work, right? Oftentimes they were working on that problem before they were even a founder and they didn't want to become a founder, but they started that kind of company. They started the company because they wanted to solve that problem. Um, and then there's another type, which is like, there's people who are just interested in new ideas and they long, they're excited about like new things and they glom onto entrepreneurship that way. Right. And that's kind of how I am. Mm -hmm. And so it's very easy for those types of entrepreneurs to get distracted by like what's coming, you know, the next shiny thing or whatever's happening. And I think, you know, for, for those people, there is a element of like the, the it's like very hard to like chase a trend right like the guys on clubhouse they were working on that before there was clubhouse you know and they oh yeah and they failed with something they did something like tinder was it something like matching matching startup right and it failed they did this thing called highlighter years and years ago that was like a location-based uh kind of matching startup and mm -hmm. then they started this company and they were working on podcasting software and then it turned into clubhouse and so you know sometimes it takes up those overnight successes take a really long time. And I think for an entrepreneur, you just have to really build up that, like, here's my plan. Here's my strategy. Here's the proof points. And what, what, when we're going to learn if it's working and I'm just going to stick to that plan and like, see it through and know that like the work I'm doing right now in two, three, four, five years, that's when it's going to pay off, you know, and really have that patience. I think like impatience is the kind of killer for, for a lot of founders, you know? Impatience and what, it, so you said there are two types of founders. What if, if you're like a second type of founder, I don't know, cause, cause I'm the first type, I'm solving a problem that I'm really passionate about people learning languages. But if we're talking about like the second type, they are never like really relate to the problem themselves. They just, they just see the opportunity and jump into it. Well, that usually doesn't work that well, right? Like that's kind of where I came from with Atrium. And I think that it's best. That's why I'm saying like the best thing to work on you know, early in the conversation, I said the best thing to work on is the thing where you really give a shit and you want to work on it. You just yeah. like want to work on that thing. And that's the only, that's the thing that would keep you focused, right? Yeah. Okay. And uh, you, you had a son, right? Yes. And I think they really, because I met you at the hospital and I was like five months pregnant, I think. When, when was his birthday? He was uh, born in September of September. 2019. Yeah. Nice. Emily was born in November, so they're oh, that's awesome. really close. Yeah. How, how, how has your life changed? Well, uh, you know, obviously having a kid is the most com kind of demand, not demanding, but like it's the most engaging thing that you'll probably ever do in, in your whole life. And so for mm -hmm. me, I think uh, it was interesting. It was like very, I love how my kids, like, you know, it's, it just gets better and better over time. You know, he's running around and um, learning stuff. And that's so much fun to watch. And like, really, we love to dance together. Like he loves yeah. dancing. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of joy in that. And then it was also hard in ways, you know, one big way was I was always kind of the master of my own destiny and time. You know, I was like the person who I could just do whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted. And 
obviously when you have a kid, you can't really do that anymore. So. Yeah. And you can't really sleep for the first months, right? Yeah. So, so some of those adjustments in the early days were, were, you know, difficult for me, but overall it's one of my friends said to me before I had a kid, he was like having a kid really rounds out the human experience. Mm. And I thought, I, I, I get it now, you know, it really does. Yeah. Like I can't imagine not having a kid. And it also makes you more disciplined. I think I read, I think Paul Graham said it. If you want to become more disciplined, <laughs> get, a, get a kid. Absolutely. Because at the time, you know, you, you used to be able to just stretch out your work like all around the clock. Now it's like, okay, I'm, you know, I gotta, I gotta go make his dinner. You know, I gotta go take him on a hike after this. I gotta go do, you know, and so it puts like constraints on your time. Exactly. Yeah. And so, um, Another question we're talking about, like startups that you're investing in. So you're looking at creator space, you're looking at biotech, right? Because you invested in a pharmacy and then. Um, yeah. So we do like healthcare companies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So where do you think is the next biggest opportunity in terms of markets? Uh, I think climate change where are those is really, really big. Mm -hmm. yeah, so so mm -hmm. um, really into like investing in climate change companies uh, with my partner, Robin, we're like, um, we think, I mean, one is it's a big, really important problem, right? Like it's probably the, the problem facing humanity in the next, you know, 50 years. Um, so we think that's, that's super important. And the second, second, uh, reason is like, I think the customers and the founder, well, there's three, three reasons. The second is the customers are there, right? Like people are starting to make decisions based on what's the environmentally friendly thing to, to buy, right? Like that's, it's become cool, right? Like they want a Tesla or they, you know, you can eat impossible foods or beyond, meat and it's you know just as good as the alternatives but you you feel better about what you're doing for the environment um this the second the third thing is that uh the third thing is that the founders want to build those companies now right it's attracting the founders and so that's almost the most important part because you got to invest in where the, the talented founders are and, and so we see yeah. more, more people who care about this problem and that's what they want to dedicate their lives to and so uh funding them is you know that's who you're looking for yeah, my, my friend is building this digital fashion startup. I love it because like taking pictures for Instagram and you just buy clothes from designers that are digital and you just wear them instead of like buying real stuff. Yeah, like, I um, love that idea. Yeah, yeah, I love it too. And she's like, she's in fashion, so she understands what, what looks the best. <laughs> um, and um, what was your lowest low in your career looking back? What was oh, like, there's so many. Is there something you would change or? Yeah, there were so many lows. I mean, um, well, there's nothing I would change. I'd start with that. There's nothing I would change because, you know, everything that happened happened for a reason. And I'll have had to happen the way it did for me to get to be the person I am today, you know, including, you know, we sell, selling Twitch before it was whatever, $20 billion company, or um, maybe we like, I worked with people where it didn't work out in the end, you know, or lost friendships over it. Like all those things, they happen for a reason. And, and, uh, I don't really have regrets, you know, I used to, I'm not saying I'm like perfect. I used to have a lot of regrets, but like now I've come to realize like, oh, it's all as it should be. Um, in terms of low lows though, you know, they happen every year. I, I wanted to quit my company like every year after founding it. I remember it usually happened in the summer because I'd be watch on Facebook and seeing all my friends like posting great like vacation pics and stuff. And I'd be like working in the dark, you know, programming something or whatever. And I was like, oh, why am I doing this? I wanted to, I want to quit. And so, um, you know, it, it, I, there were a lot of times when that were low lows, but. Um, but yeah, you said you never regretted uh, selling Twitch. And what do you think, like something it's grown to? Do you like what's happening to the company? Well, I think Amazon has really supported the growth of the company. Yeah, it's grown to be like a pretty amazing company. And I think a very iconic company. And I think that's amazing for, you know, obviously our legacy as founders. Yeah. It is, it's just a lot of people complaining about bands. Like when I ask them on Instagram, what do you want to ask Justin? It's like, why is, is this person banned? Why is that person banned? Yeah, well, you know, with internet moderation, you're never going to make people happy, right? Like it's yeah, like exactly. if you ban Donald Trump, then there's going to be 40% of the population that's like, you're you know, ter you're terrible. Like, and if you're, you know, that, that's the way people feel about it. So, you know, there's people who maybe have done stuff on the platform that, you know, it's user generated content. So people do the whole range of human behaviors and some set of them twitch the i mean i'm not in control <laughs> everyone's always on my youtube on my uh content they're always like why did you ban this person i'm like i have nothing to do with it. i haven't been at the company in seven years so uh 
I have nothing to do with it, but, and I don't even know what the answer is, but, you know, there's a team at Twitch who really cares or is like, you know, set, implementing a set of rules that they feel like is going to build the community to be the best it can be. And, you know, you're never going to make everyone happy. Do, do you get haters yourself online already? Cause you're like growing on YouTube really fast. Your growth is amazing. You're getting like over 10, 10 K subscribers, 50,000 K on your previous video, which is yeah. Thing. It's it's been fun to see. Like I'm 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 excited about it. I uh, the hater like I don't you know I'm surprised actually. The comments are very positive, uh, yeah. except for like why did you ban this person? Which is, I find to be hilarious. <laughs> There's you know people are very positive about my content. Um, I think that there is a little bit on TikTok, especially people being like sometimes when I'm like, Hey, money doesn't make you happy. People are like, they don't believe it. Right. They don't want to believe it. Or they say, Oh, that's rich guy shit. You know, like, of course you would say that you don't have to worry about rent. Um, which I understand that sentiment. I actually thought that too, when I heard people who are successful say, Oh, money doesn't make you happy. I was like, I don't believe that, you know? And so I get it. But, um, at the same time, I've kind of seen the experiment of like, Oh, I, from making $800 a month when we were just starting off and eating burritos to like, you know, every, every uh, step of the way and that, you know, kind of getting, becoming more and more successful. Like it was, I wasn't happier because of like how much money I was making. The things that drove my own happiness were, um, were, you know, my connections with the people around me, yeah. whether I felt like I was connected with the people around me, whether I was in a centered and grounded place myself, you know, those, mm -hmm. those types of things. Do, do you feel the urge to get back to people like on TikTok and reply to them? No, you're wrong. Or do you just ignore what happens? No, I, you know, I try to give people like, you know, if it's, if someone's like engaging in a conversation, I try to actually engage with them. I actually get the most haters on Twitter. I think before I even started video, I think the people, people on video are actually quite kind, I think, which is reflective of. You, you'll see it a little later. Okay. You're like, you're like, you're not big enough yet. <laughs> you'll see it. The, but yeah, it's, it's you'll coming. See, you'll see it. All right. So on Twitter, maybe it's because I've been there longer or whatever, oftentimes people like, they want to quote tweet me and be like, oh, this guy fucking is out of touch or whatever. I, you know, when I was like, last year during the pandemic, I would say, like, I don't think our model of like doing the lockdowns in California is going to be the most, we're sacrificing a lot for what I think is like a very low effectiveness. That's what I would say. Like it's sacrificing a lot and we're not, I don't think this is effective. And people would be like, you're trying to kill my grandma. And like yeah. you, this, you are like a heartless venture capitalist who makes more money when you... Oh yeah, you're just making money on us. Yeah, I get it. And the thing is, the funny thing is like actually, <laughs> I mean, this is terrible to say, but like the pandemic has been a huge boon to the technology industry. You know, it's like mm -hmm. in a bad way, in my opinion, it's like people have to order things online because they don't want to go out, right? Like that is, so it's actually, I make more money when the economy is locked down. Like, exactly. And, yeah. and, but I think it is worse for society and not a good trade-off. And so, you know, it's like, I should be champion lockdowns, but like, I'm not, I'm saying like, maybe mm -hmm. we should consider this anyways, people like to shit on me for that. But uh, other than that, I'm. Yeah, cool. Yeah, well, c congrats on your growth. I think, yeah, your YouTube has, has a really bright future. Thank and you. Uh, I love um, your stories, by the way. Yeah, go ahead. No, I'm just having a lot of fun with it. I actually genuinely really like making these YouTube videos. And, and your team edits everything. So you just send them the footage and they edit. Yeah. So, so I'll like, we'll come up with an idea together. Um, Jen Lee, she's my producer. She actually was the one who was like, you got to make YouTubes and TikToks. And I was like, okay, I was a little skeptical and she's my producer. And so we're, we like come up with an idea or like I have a bunch of stories, you know, a, a long list. And then I come up with an idea, we write out like a script um, and then I'll, kind of create the, the the content and then she'll edit it yeah she kind of edits all the you know she edits it for youtube so it's, so it's super tight and like <laughs> just like doesn't let up you know nice yeah and uh, i wanted to ask you what do you think is your superpower because looking at your youtube videos i can definitely say that storytelling is something you're so good at oh thank you so yeah storytelling i think i think i've always thought i'm a great catalyzer of people like when i have an idea i put it in a story and i can tell that story and people are excited about it, you know? And so mm -hmm. that's a real fundamental skill for startups, right? Because you need somebody to get everyone excited and hyped up and working on whatever the mm -hmm. problem is, you know, you're selling your co-founders and employees and investors and uh, customers. And so I've always been a really great storyteller and, and catalyzer. And I think that's my, really one of the only things I'm, I'm very good at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there are other things that you're great at, but your storytelling skill is amazing. 
Um, and maybe the, yeah, the last question. Uh, who would you recommend for the next interview? Because Gary Tan recommended you and I was so happy he did it. Uh, maybe you know someone who's, you know, maybe a VC starting on YouTube or an entrepreneur starting on YouTube because I love to chat about that as well. Um, I, what about Lee Jin from Atelier Ventures? Who is that's that's a yeah, that's a great. I'm, I'm jumping on a call with her in in March because we actually met when she was working at uh, Andreessen Horowitz, and uh, she actually invited us. She, so we pitched Lingua Trip, and they also invited us to talk about start like growing on YouTube. That was that was yeah. a lot of fun. Awesome. Yeah, good, great nomination. Yeah, thank you so much. That was amazing, very insight insightful. Hoping that you know when the pandemic is over, when you're back in Silicon Valley, yeah, uh, we'll love meet, to up. meet up. Cool. Bye bye. Have a good one. Yeah. See ya. Bye bye.